when Attorney General Merrick Garland announced the restoration of DOJ's Access to Justice Office, now led by Rachel Rossi, he acknowledged an uncomfortable reality in the U.S. criminal justice system. Quote, there can be no equal justice without equal access to justice. And because we do not yet have equal access to justice in America, the task before us is urgent, unquote. At the time, the deadly pandemic had worsened longstanding gaps in a system plagued by inadequate legal assistance, putting personal liberty at risk, threatening to separate families, and forcing countless others to face the prospect of eviction. Since then, Director Rossi has traveled the country highlighting this urgency of inequity in which communities of color and the poor have too often been left to fend for themselves. Closing this gap not only requires the government to act, but directly implicates our obligation as journalists to the communities we serve, where enterprising reporters have helped shape local criminal justice policy for generations. We are fortunate to have Rachel Rossi help set the tone for our discussion over the next couple of days. And following her remarks, we'll open it up for questions. Please welcome Rachel Rossi. much, Kevin, for that kind introduction, uh, and good morning. It truly is a privilege and an honor to be here in Philadelphia and to welcome you to this critical summit. Thank you to Radio Television Digital News Association and to the National Press Foundation for convening this important event. I have to say I'm inspired to see leaders in the journalism industry here and criminal justice officials and leaders thinking critically about how crime has been and continues to be covered and committed to improving reporting on the criminal justice system in the media. So as Kevin said in October of 2021, Attorney General Garland reestablished the Office for Access to Justice to ensure that we are making the promise of equal justice for all real. This means that we break down barriers to the founding and enduring principle of the Department of Justice, equal justice under law. Our office has gone from zero to now 43 dedicated professional staff, and we are tasked with leading a whole of government approach to expanding and modernizing the department's access to justice function across both civil and criminal legal systems. With this mission, the Office for Access to Justice leads a number of initiatives, including we lead the federal government pro bono program, which is the hub for federal government lawyers to access and be referred to pro bono work. We also direct and staff the work of the White House Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable. This is a collaboration of over 28 federal agencies co-chaired by Attorney General Garland and White House Counsel's Office. We lead language access policy um, and resources for the Justice Department, and we house the department-wide language access coordinator. And we lead efforts to promote access to justice through reforms that promote economic justice, improved reentry after incarceration, reduced recidivism, better access to counsel and legal help for those who need it most, including in rural areas and legal deserts. We believe that justice belongs to everyone. If you can't access it because of lack of financial resources, the language you speak, where you live or who you are, we simply cannot call it justice. And as we pursue the mission of access to justice for all, the media as a critical civil institution can be a part of the solution. The media has a unique vantage point and an ability to educate the public and frame policy issues. This is especially true as television and written media remain a critical source of news and information for the American public. You can carefully select what to report on or how to report it. You can fact check, contextualize, provide healthy skepticism in your coverage. You can ensure critical systems are accountable and transparent to the public. And your framing of critical criminal justice issues can drive public perceptions and promote data-driven and equitable criminal justice policy. 
Today, I want to quickly address three broad areas where the media can demonstrate leadership in coverage of justice and access to justice issues. First, the media can provide the public with a clear understanding of the gaps that exist in accessing justice, including the gaps disproportionately experienced by communities of color. And this includes utilizing a people-centered approach and elevating the voices of those who are impacted by our justice systems. Second, the media can help provide transparency of the criminal justice system by ensuring the public has accurate information and visibility into the roles and in the importance of all of the actors in the criminal justice system, including and perhaps most often mischaracterized and misperceived public defenders. And third, the media has the power to shape public perceptions about innovation and data-driven justice solutions, helping to reinforce and promote policies that improve access to justice for all. So first, the media can provide the public with a clear understanding of access to justice gaps through a people-centered lens. Like Kevin sort of said in, at, at the beginning here, as the federal office dedicated to ensuring access to justice for all, we exist because simply put, not everyone enjoys the promises and the protections of our laws equally. And for us to create meaningful initiatives to close the pervasive justice gap, it is critical for these harms and disparities to be understood and clearly visible, both to the communities experiencing them and to the policymakers, leaders, and the public and those in positions of power to create change. So for example, some of our office's efforts to better understand and highlight these justice gaps include a partnership that we entered into with DOJ's Bureau of Justice Statistics to study the feasibility of better collecting critical national level data on outcomes in high volume civil courts, like debt collection, small claims court, eviction, uh, family courts. These are the courts that affect millions of Americans each year. We're also partnering with BJS on the Access to Justice Design and Testing Program, which includes the launch of the first ever Civil Legal Needs Survey in the United States. Through this effort, we're utilizing a people-centered approach by collecting data directly from households across the country about their civil legal problems. The survey will also include new resources to test the feasibility of other access to justice related data collections so that we can shed new light on things like the impact of justice system fines and fees, expungements of criminal records, and other areas. We know that the best way to truly understand the justice gap, systemic failures, and possible solutions is to employ this type of a people-centered approach. What is a people-centered approach? A people-centered justice approach requires us to consistently center the voices of the people, particularly the voices of historically underserved and marginalized communities in the development of our policies and initiatives to advance access to justice. It requires us to prioritize the perspective of communities and to incorporate that consistent feedback across all of our work. And media can also play a role in elevating the need for access to justice solutions using a people-centered approach and lens in a number of ways. For example, media can deploy people-centered language in crime coverage. As of course you know better than most of us as journalists, language is incredibly powerful. Language shapes thoughts and attitudes and can influence how a society sees and treats groups of people. Utilizing traditional crime-first terms and labels can reinforce historical marginalization and dehumanization. This can ultimately stifle innovation and blunt necessary public discussion on safety, reform, and recidivism. So terms like felon, criminal, inmate, these terms are what, what we generally call crime-first terms, and they can instill fear and stereotyping. Conversely, terms like people who are incarcerated or individuals with a felony conviction can center the humanity of people and can avoid stigmatization or defining people only by a past act. Beyond terminology alone, it's also important to elevate and platform a diverse array of people impacted by the justice system and crime coverage. 
This means to not only platform innocent exonerees or those who have been brutally victimized by the criminal legal system, although those perspectives are important. It requires us to also listen to the people who regularly churn through our criminal justice system, those directly impacted by arrest, criminal conviction, and incarceration, and their families. Hearing these people's perspectives, the good and the bad, on how traditional policies have impacted them and their families, alongside hearing the critical perspectives of victims, is necessary to inform public debate and policymaking. So for example, recently our office engaged directly with people impacted by the federal criminal legal system to better understand the specific legal needs that they face. The Office for Access to Justice joined in partnership with the Federal Bureau of Prisons to administer a voluntary survey to incarcerated individuals to hear from them directly on their civil legal needs. More than 50,000 adults in custody responded, and the overwhelming majority of them responded stating that they would benefit from civil legal services. In response to hearing directly from impacted people, the Office for Access to Justice is partnering with the Federal Bureau of Prisons to announce the development of an innovative civil legal services pilot. We want to provide civil legal help to people incarcerated in Federal Bureau of Prisons facilities. And our hope is that providing targeted civil legal services, we will be able to improve successful reentry, disrupt the cycle of incarceration, unresolved civil legal needs, poverty, and recidivism. So second, the media can also help to ensure that the criminal justice system is both accountable and transparent to the public by providing the public with accurate information and visibility into how the justice system works and the roles and importance of all of the actors within the criminal justice system. So of course this includes the judges, of course this includes the prosecutors, but perhaps most often mischaracterized are public defenders. The Office for Access to Justice acts as the principal legal advisor for the Department of Justice on the right to counsel and other Sixth Amendment rights. With this mandate, we are working to elevate the voices of public defenders. We're doing it within commissions, policymaking bodies, working groups, but also elevating public defenders amongst the legal profession and the public at large because they have a critical perspective and a constitutional importance. Antiquated stereotypes about public defenders continue to persist. I'm sure we've all heard them and seen them. Stereotypes that they are incompetent and bad lawyers, or even worse, that they are unethical, willing to do anything or say anything to just help get their client off. And it's not only because I have a past as a former public defender that I am compelled to quash these inaccurate stereotypes. Uh, it's not only because public defenders that I have seen are among the most skilled, creative, brilliant, and talented of attorneys, or even because of their deep commitment to justice, humanism, and community safety and wellness. And it's not just because public defenders have high ethical standards that they are forced to ground themselves in as they frequently face the complex ethical questions that necessarily arise across our justice systems. It's critical to dispel these false stereotypes about public defenders because they represent the fairness of the American justice system and the constitutional protections of the Sixth Amendment. As Attorney General Garland stated when he was discussing the critical promise of a public defender reinforced by Gideon versus Wainwright, he said, quote, justice demands more than good prosecutors and good judges. It demands meaningful access to counsel for the accused including those who cannot afford attorneys. In their daily work, public defenders are tasked with the mighty responsibility of ensuring that the constitutional promises core to our justice system, innocent until proven guilty, speedy trial, due process, reasonable search and seizure. Public defenders make sure these promises are realized. In this way, they make sure that every part of our system is fairer, more equal, and more just. They protect individual rights, sometimes can expose corruption and misfeasance, and can protect against wrongful convictions. And as such, they are a critical component of our pursuit for public safety. In an effort to bring just this type of visibility and to celebrate and elevate public defense as a career, 
Last year, our office led a countrywide tour to mark the 60th anniversary of Gideon versus Wainwright. During that tour, high-level Justice Department officials joined me in visits with public defenders, impacted communities, and advocates across the United States. We traveled from urban centers to southern, midwestern, tribal, and rural areas. And we announced specific actions our office would take, informed by what we heard. As one example, Deputy Attorney General Monaco joined us to launch the tour and announced that we would conduct a comprehensive review of access to counsel in Federal Bureau of Prison pretrial facilities. Our office has been proud to co-lead that review, and in July we released a report that includes over 30 concrete recommendations that we are working with the Bureau of Prisons to implement. We took these steps as Justice Department officials to elevate the importance of public defense as a critical constitutional protection to ensure equal access to justice. We focus on elevating the unique voices and perspectives of public defenders. Public defenders represent over 80% of people who interact with the criminal legal system. They have valuable insight to contribute, not just on their individual cases and clients, but also on important public safety and policy issues, including community needs, public safety, and the direct and collateral impact of criminal justice system impact. This is why responsible press coverage on crime in the criminal justice system must include the perspectives of public defenders. And this should be in all their different forms. Press should regularly consider how to engage with full-time public defense offices, contract defenders, public defender executives or commissions, public information officers, and labor unions who represent public defenders. Third and finally, the media has the power to shape public perceptions about innovation and data-driven solutions, helping to reinforce policies that improve access to justice for all. Elevating and telling the stories of innovative policy efforts by local leaders can be incredibly powerful to catalyze, scale, expand, and promote evidence-based justice system policies that work. For similar reasons, our office is elevating innovative reforms being led by local leaders across the country. One way we've done so recently is in the area of criminal justice system fines and fees. So many of you may know that the assessment of fines and fees can sometimes have a devastating impact on a person's life. A $500 fine for violating a municipal ordinance that could be an inconvenience to an affluent litigant. But for a low-income litigant, that $500 fine can mean choosing between complying with a court order and feeding their children or paying rent. And we decided to find a way to bring visibility to those who are reforming these practices of assessing fines and fees across the country. In October, the Office for Access to Justice published uh, a report called Access to Justice Spotlight, Fines and Fees. Our report aims to shed a light on the broad array of reforms that are taking place in diverse jurisdictions across the country. It spotlights the work of 46 states, including the efforts of state legislatures, counties, municipalities, courts, and local prosecutors. In this way, this report encourages creative approaches to expanding economic justice and it aims to serve as a resource for policymakers looking to decrease systemic reliance on fines and fees and to redress the harms fines and fees can cause. Visibility of diverse and innovative criminal justice policies that work is critical. I do not have to remind those of you in this room about the power held by media, press, and journalists. The focus and framing of your stories silently shape and influence not only broad public sentiment and policy reform, but also the outcomes for numerous people who interact with the criminal legal system every day. And I know this goal is sometimes elusive and sometimes not intuitive. We often see stories about increased crime and specific crime occurrences. I know this conference is aptly named, If It Bleeds, It Leads, and this has long been the norm, particularly when this has been an effective method to get interest, clicks, and views. One 2020 study of a specific jurisdiction corroborated this general problem. 
In comparison with actual crime rates, this study found that the new sources disproportionately covered violent crime and within the violent crime category, disproportionately covered homicides. And rarely do we see stories that capture positive justice system outcomes, especially in television media. Yet I have seen it. I've seen the impact of constitutional and equitable criminal justice policies firsthand. Things like diversion, reduced fines and fees, reduced charging, drug treatment, pretrial release, and more. I've seen parents reunited with children, pets saved from euthanasia, jobs kept, mental health treatment that actually works, drug addiction treated, evictions avoided, evidence preserved, and innocence proven. When crime coverage is only reactive and fails to level the same type of scrutiny and critique on traditional policies and systems as it does on innovation and reform, we risk painting an incomplete picture. And an even greater risk is influencing public discussion, perceptions, time, investment, and resources away from new and effective approaches to public safety. Of course, the public must hear about the problem. Crime and public safety are important for public visibility, transparency, and education. But the public also must hear about the solutions. When coverage includes the everyday stories of people who have benefited from criminal justice system reform, or when they include data that reveals how reforms can enhance public safety, this can encourage innovation in policies that expand access to justice. So as I close, I think it's very important to recognize the difficult and heavy burden that you all carry. I know there are many pressures that you face and various considerations you have to juggle as the role of the media. And as the role of the media and the format of public access to news simply continues to shift. Thinking about crime coverage differently will require creativity and boldness. And plainly put, it will require new strategies to still create the clickable coverage that paints a more accurate criminal justice story. Media can make real the constitutional right to a public criminal trial, reinforcing principles of transparency and fairness. The press have long held systems of public officials accountable. Journalists play a role in exposing misfeasance and informing the public about complex legal processes and laws. And today, I call on you to also see your role as a partner in the effort to expand access to justice for all. We cannot deploy novel approaches to crime and violence or reform our deeply inequitable criminal legal system without your help. We cannot pursue new approaches to public safety without public understanding of the true impact of policies. The success of evidence-based interventions is highly dependent on the frame and context of your stories, the sources of information and data you present, and the analysts you call on to help the public understand these new approaches. So again, I thank you today for your commitment and your leadership, and thank you for having me uh, here at this conference. It's an honor, so I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Could you provide some more detail on the innovative uh, approaches you were talking about in terms of people assessing fines and fees? I can't recall the exact name of the program you mentioned, but I'm interested in Sure, yes. So what we did was we did a broad survey of 46 different states looking at what different jurisdictions were doing to reduce reliance on fines and fees. The report is called Access to Justice Spotlight fines and fees, and we can definitely get you a copy of it. Um, but what you'll see, it's a lengthy report, and it really spotlights a broad and diverse array of different possible approaches to reducing reliance on fines and fees. One of the things that the report aims to do is to recognize jurisdictions are different. Rural areas are different than urban areas. Different jurisdictions have different methods and means of collecting resources and revenue for their court systems. So it tried to take a look broadly at the different ways that different officials can reduce reliance on fines and fees. And we're happy to get you a copy. Okay. Thanks. Mm. 
Hi, I'm Rochelle with ABC Action News in Tampa. Do you have any tips on fostering that relationship with the Public Defender's Office? We've been trying, I think they may have been burned in the past. I think that's why they're reluctant to talk to us and maybe tell some stories that might be more positive. Any tips on fostering that relationship with them? I think that is a great question and a really good point. Um, I think sometimes public defender, I think one thing to recognize is some public defender offices have different mechanisms and abilities to reach out to the press. So sometimes they may have a public affairs officer you could communicate with, other times they don't. Other times they may have policies that they can't talk to the press. So I think demonstrating the willingness to talk to them and demonstrating, I think it's in the way that you're asking the question Right, because I think a lot of public defenders may fear that what you want to know is, you know, is their client really guilty and sort of portray the client in a bad light. So I think portraying the question in terms of, you know, these are the broader policy questions I'd like to cover or sort of framing it in a way where it's clear that there's more that you're seeking to sort of get from the conversation, I think could be helpful. And we'd also be very happy to kind of connect you with, there are some national public defense leaders who are thinking about how they can provide resources to public defense offices and sort of educate and train public defense offices so that from the other side, they're also thinking about things a little differently. Sure. Hi, Brianna Hollis with KXAN in Austin. My question kind of builds on that, but when you're talking about this kind of misrepresentation of public defenders, what kinds of stories would you suggest to kind of help bring that other side out? So I guess one thing I would point to is, I'm not sure if folks in the room have heard of the National Legal Aid and Defender Association, NLADA. Interestingly, they actually have a campaign right now that is focused on painting a different picture sort of of public defenders and so they have a lot of um, videos and different coverage that essentially it's sort of simple just portraying public defenders as good lawyers um, demonstrating how public defenders um, can win cases but also even if they don't win cases how they have good legal expertise come from good legal training uh, sort of just portraying them in a light that is uh, how you would portray a private counsel um, in a particular case um, so would be happy to connect you to that because i think they're very focused on that exact question and developing um, specific responses to it Thank you. sure good morning good morning uh, casey clark from queen city news in charlotte uh, two things about transparency. One, uh, the DOJ, I have found, is one of the most difficult organizations to get a FOIA back from. So if you're going to talk about transparency, what is the Garland team doing to make it easier to get records back? I have FOIAs that go back more than eight years that still have not been satisfied. About every 18 months, I get an, an email that says, we're working on it. Two, uh, Rule 53 about cameras in courtrooms. When it went into effect in 1946, why is the Garland administration in, in this day not doing anything to reform or to throw out Rule 53 and to allow cameras in federal court? Those are both excellent questions. And I can actually refer you to our Office of Public Affairs, who can probably connect you with the right folks at DOJ to answer both of those questions. But I think those are critical questions. Wait, 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 you can't just pass me off. I mean, if you're full of journals. <laughs> right. I mean, you can't ask for, uh, you know, I don't need that. You, can just, <laughs> you, can't, you can't say, well, we need to do all these nice things, but we're going to hide behind our PR people, and we're not going to push for transparency in court, and we're not going to fulfill our public records request. We're going to say, well, it's a new administration. We'll look at that when we get to it, but we have a big backlog. And that's what we keep getting over and over and over again. And there is no accountability within the DOJ when it comes to those things. Right. Well, and uh, to be clear, I'm not going to pass you off. And I'd be happy to give you, to make sure you get our card so we can directly get you some answers on that. But I think these are very important questions. It's just not the expertise of the Office for Access to Justice to be able to provide you the direct response. Uh, but we will get directly in touch with you and make sure that you get the right answers. We will not just pass you off. Any, anyone else? Hi, um, my name is Rabia Burks. I am with the National Legal Aid and Defender Association. I just wanted to say very much so thank you for your remarks about public defenders and 
the importance of covering them in your coverage amongst all the other coverage that you all do. And I'm just, just wanted to say that. Thank you. Anyone else? I really wanted to make more of a, a comment than a, a question. So I think like you asked what kinds of stories can we do on public defenders. So I'm in the management role on TV and I can tell you if a reporter says, I wanna do a profile on a public defender, it's not gonna happen. But what you can do is make sure we're including them in our coverage. So when we're getting one side of the alleged victim, we also need to get the side of the suspect, and that would be their lawyer, and if they have a public defender, we should be reaching out to them as well. So I think that is probably, we're not gonna do happy stories about lawyers on either side, you know? <laughs> but we should include them in our coverage. I, I think that's exactly right, because I, I'll add to that as well. I think sometimes it's just, the terminology and referring to the public defender, or it could be just sort of portray, you know, sometimes even just portraying a public defender in court. Um, you know, sometimes it's just the way that you talk about a public defender tied into a broader story, because I agree with you. I don't know how many people want to read a story just about a great public defender. Hi there, I'm Fadia Patterson from Bay News 9 in Tampa, Florida. I had a question about the well, I just wanted to know more about the Civil Legal Services Program. You say it's brand new. Can you mention again the goal of that program? Absolutely. So what we found is people who are incarcerated tend to have higher debt, tend to have issues like getting cut off from federal benefits, housing, things of that nature, tend to have issues with losing custody of their children. So what we wanted to do is to explore a way to provide that civil legal help and to see how that can impact recidivism. So that once you are released from custody, if you have access to a job, employment, housing, your children, how does that help to improve outcomes such that you're not cycling back into the criminal justice system? At this point, we're still in the phase of sort of working toward the launch with the Bureau of Prisons, but we'd be happy to stay in touch with you and get you more information yeah, as soon as we launch. Stories like that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I know you kind of mentioned it's it's <coughs> the side of the public defender in a story. If we're not able to get that side, I know you mentioned you know the terminology and speaking about that. Uh, I'm I'm just kind of racking my brain trying to think about how I've handled these cases. You know, it's typically you know I do say at the end of the day we did reach out to the defendant's attorney. We didn't hear back. Is there anything? Is there an improvement that can be made upon that in a situation like that? I think if there's not really any additional information that you're including in that story, I think you're doing the best you can to sort of provide the ethical response. I do think there's also a sort of an opportunity to think about strategic new ways to maybe profile what a public defender program is being launched or other efforts like that. One recently when we did um, our tour of the, uh, the Gideon tour that we did across six different stops across the country, we actually re reached out to local press every step of the way and invited our local press to join us and to meet the public defenders and to hear about a lot of the innovative work that they're doing. So in some areas, public defenders were creating holistic defense models where they didn't just represent you on the case, but they did more to help you with civil legal help or other kind of areas. In other areas, we talked about um, public defenders have partnered with social workers to sort of provide that social work help. So. Sometimes that's an opportunity. I also take your point that sometimes it may not be what's accessible to you in the story that you're trying to portray. We would be happy though to, to also work with you if there's a way to sort of think if there's something locally for your area to profile or to think about. Um, but if, if you don't have anything to include in the story and there's no response, I, I don't know what else you would add. Uh, Jim Van Ostrand, Next Star. Um, I'm a, I'm a longtime crime reporter back in the day. And one of the things I've noticed was the biggest challenge was the lack of public defenders, especially depending on the area that you lived in. And if some counties that might have one public defender for 200 clients, they don't have time to, is there anything going on the federal level or elsewhere to address that inequity? 
I'm glad you asked because this is one of the core mandates and directives of our office and sort of one of the main reasons our office was established because we recognize that as the Justice Department, in order to actually see equal access to justice for all, a critical piece of that is well-resourced public defense. So we are working with in a number of different areas to see how we can rectify this problem. On the Gideon tour, we announced a number of actions that we're doing to expand support and resources for public defense. The federal uh, sort of review that we did of access to counsel and Bureau of Prisons facilities, this is one way where we're working directly to increase those resources. So we'd be happy to get you more information on that, but there are 30, over 30 specific recommendations on specific areas where we can help federal public defenders better access their clients. Um, and some of that includes, you know, sometimes public defenders may not have resources to get to their clients the voluminous e-discovery that they may get in a case and how do we navigate ensuring that we can either improve and simplify that process such that the resources aren't as needed or expand resources for public defense. In other areas, we're partnering with our grant making offices to see how we can utilize existing federal grant streams or promote new ones to expand support for grant funding for public defense. On the Gideon tour, another step that we took is we partnered with the Office of Justice Programs and we issued a letter encouraging states and reminding states that burn JAG funding goes for is can be resourced for public defense in addition to law enforcement. So we're trying to take steps that we can, but I think you hit the exact issue that we're trying to rectify. Hi, I'm Mary. I'm with TMJ4 in Milwaukee. You mentioned the importance of vernacular, specifically when we're referring and reporting on crime. A lot of the crime that we do is, in the moment, breaking news, what's happening now. Can you speak a little bit on ways to humanize folks we're reporting on in these breaking news scenarios with the way that we report on them, specifically? Absolutely. I think as a general sort of way of thinking, if you can think about the person first before the actual descriptor of what makes them part of the criminal justice system, that's the sort of best approach. So instead of saying a felon, you can say someone convicted of a felony. Or instead of saying an inmate, a person who is incarcerated. Um, that's sort of the general thinking. I will say this, sometimes it can be difficult. Sometimes it means more words, um, and you may not have the ability to say it in a snappy way. So I think it takes being strategic and intentional, even though um, it may not always be the easiest way to frame a story. I don't really know quite the question, but uh, just from covering like the indictments, and obviously your, your office around access, it, some of our coverage has been challenging because the privileges that some of these defendants have is is not the norm. So when we cover it, um, we've struggled to kind of outline the process because their process looks very different than what maybe the average defendant looks like. I, I guess my question is just how do we do a better job of kind of highlighting these high profile indictments and all the coverage that's required, but also recognizing that there's a couple different worlds that we're all living in. And I know privilege isn't new, but especially just given the notoriety of these cases, um, still ongoing, any advice? So without commenting specifically on any particular case or, or any um, indictments, I think you really are hitting a very critical kind of balancing issue that we have to struggle with in the criminal justice system. Because open public press and availability in our court systems is critical to the Constitution. And at the same time, there are reasons that certain things need to be privileged, need to not be known by the public to also preserve the equitable results in a case. So I think it's complicated and I think it's commendable that you're navigating and struggling and sort of pushing through those complex um, competing interests. Um, but I think that always will be part of the tension. And I think it's it's complicated, but that's part of what we have to do. And I think it's important that the press continue to push. Um, and it's important for justice system actors to continue to sort of protect when they have to in certain scenarios as well. So I don't know if this is more of a question, but kind of just like adding to the conversation with you were talking about with the vernacular, because um, I'm struggling too with the like person who was convicted of a felony. I'm just trying to think about how that would be realistic, not just because it is 
a lot of words and we only get a minute and a half to tell a story, so every word counts, but also just as reporters, we try, especially on TV, we try so hard to be conversational and you know, be relatable and that's just not how people talk. So I would just, my concern would be that it would just widen the gap between us and our viewers and just make us seem even less relatable and less accessible. I think that's a great point, but I also think that press can sort of drive how people talk. Um, I do think there's ways that you can think about using terms that aren't those sort of justice system impacted person or person who is incarcerated by just sort of telling the story, a person who's in prison, right? I think there's there's ways to think about it creatively, but I don't think it's easy. So that's why I was saying I think it's it's um, it takes strategy and it takes intentionality, but it won't always be able to be done. Like sometimes you may just have, you know, sometimes we struggle with, you know, often the criminal code says the word inmate, right? Or says the word alien. Um, and so sometimes, you know, it's it's taking society in a direction that requires all of our partnership in our work, but I think it's sometimes a slow process and it's just kind of doing it where you can and when you can. Uh, hi, I'm Suzanne Potter with California News Service. And I guess just the, my sort of comment for everybody is that one way we can concretely affect this is to try and be as dispassionate as possible and keep the indignation and the disgust out of your voice um, when you talk about certain crimes or any crimes or any any kind of story and I just my sort of theory on this that's hard right you hear about a horrible crime and it disgusts you but to get on the air and and have that that emotional like this happened and 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 isn't it awful um that can prejudice things for the for the person who's accused of it and i just a little tiny story but one time many years whatever how long ago i was in court and somebody was some public official was accused of um taking drugs and uh and so we were sitting there and i'm sitting there with the, the other reporters next to me and we're, we're saying oh my god how could that guy do that blah 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 and then we realize, to our horror, that the guy's 14-year-old son and wife is right behind us in the courthouse. And of course, we wanted the family's perspective on what was going on, and they looked at us like we were just the vermin scum of the earth. And I felt so bad, and that was when I was really much younger, and I, that was a big lesson to me, was to never talk about the uh, the the defendant uh, in a in a in an emotional and, and angry way because you never know who's right next to you but also just because maybe that guy didn't take the drugs maybe it was just a, a you know a mistake i don't know even if he did should it should it humiliate his 14 year old son so that's that was my comment was that we can somehow see i kind of try to make my coverage be fair both from the perspective of either side of it so that the 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 defendant or in my opinion as a mother the defendant's mother could watch my story and not have a legitimate concern about accuracy or the way i presented it it's a great comment thank you Um, so we've seen the uh, progressive uh, prosecutor movement really spread from Philly to you know the Bay Area to Minneapolis to everywhere else. Um, can you talk about how you've seen broadcast media and uh, specifically like reinforce some of the like traditional law and order narratives um, and the missteps that they've made? So I think that's that's a, a very critical component of how media has to think about its role is that when there are missteps highlight the missteps. Um, when things work, highlight that, that, that they work. I think sometimes it takes a little bit more effort to dig into data, to see whether there are additional reports, to kind of do a little more digging, and I know you don't always have the time for all of that. Um, but I do think that's kind of the point, is uh, when we think about reforms, modern approaches to justice across the board from whomever is trying to make those reforms happen, if we, do, if we level criticism against those reforms, and we're not leveling criticism against the traditional approaches to the justice system or you know, the racial disparities that exist in the system as they are now, um, then we're starting to paint a picture that is potentially inaccurate. So I think it's you know, thinking about 
criticisms when you need to make criticisms about new policies, but also um, finding ways to think about, you know, is, is what about the traditional approach? Has there been, is there something to be criticized there as well? Um, and thinking about kind of a more balanced approach in, in um, bringing those criticisms and also highlighting and sort of supporting the data when it shows that it is working. Hello, I'm Deja Charles with um, KGTV in San Diego. Um, I want to get back to the vernacular thing, though, because I know that that has become a very hot topic in the last five years, particularly, um, with all the different type of coverage we've been seeing, especially within 2020. But specifically, my question is, um, as journalists, obviously, we, for lack of better terms, take the uh, language we're given and trying to make it as palatable to our viewers as best as we can. Um, I think, though, in the same way, something that makes it challenging, though, is the fact that, especially when we're talking about federal agencies, um, we also have to keep in mind agendas and their purpose and what they're trying to portray themselves. Um, and so, as you're telling us that it's important to keep in mind the way that we portray public defenders and whatnot, it's also challenging, though, when you have other um, agencies who are giving us language that very much has been blatantly biased and whatnot. So my question is, I mean, from a federal family sense, how are you guys working together to get on the same consensus? Because hearing one thing saying like, hey, see the humanity in the people that we're trying to present in the same way on the other side, where you have um, a federal agency involved, it is perceived and portrayed as something completely different, especially when you're talking like things are political. So I think we have a lot of work to do ourselves in-house across the federal government. And you know, by saying that vernacular is something that press should be thinking about, in no way do I not say that we should also be really thinking about how we are um, improving the language that we use. I think there's also, you mentioned sort of the sort of inherent complexity when you're trying to sort of quote and bring that information in. And I think it's difficult. So I think it's sort of a case-by-case -case basis where sometimes you, you can't. You have to sort of stick to the language language that has been given to you. I think those of us in the justice system who think about using different terminology, we're faced with similar issues, like, like I said before, if it's in the criminal code or if we're quoting someone who said something a certain way. So I think it's about trying to take society to a different place together and making those steps and those changes where we can, but recognizing that sometimes it is too difficult. And so it's, it's really trying to push where you can. One of the things that our office has been focused on is we are looking at partnerships across the Department of Justice to see how we can simplify access for the public to the programs and services that we that we do and a big piece of that is plain language and what we have found is using plain language is not so easy for lawyers and a lot of times it can be really tricky and complex to change language that is in statutes language you know language that is legal or has been litigated um, and to try to make it more accessible as well and so I just, I just say that this is you know, something that we all have to sort of partner in and think about how we can sort of move in the direction. Sometimes, you know, I know you're very often probably restricted on when you can quote someone versus when you're doing background, which can also make it complex. But if there are ways that when that terminology is used, you can actually quote the person or quote the source in a way that it's sort of demonstrated that it's a term of art or someone else saying it, I think that's a helpful tool as well, if it's possible. Uh, but I, I recognize that there are complexities. Hi, I just wanted to share one way that we've been striving, we're not perfect at it, but we've been striving at it at WSB. We did a trust survey and found that viewers in Atlanta, um, they really don't trust national media, but they also have, um, don't trust local media as much as they used to. So that was about two years ago. So since then, we've been making a concerted effort to really watch our language in general about all things that we say. And so we try not to say suspect. It's hard. You know, sometimes it creeps in. But we try to say, is it a man or a woman? Do we know? Well, the man is accused of blah, blah, blah. Or the woman is accused. Um, not so much with people who are convicted, but those who haven't been convicted yet, we try to go that extra mile. And that's one little tweak that actually does make a difference. Um, and it's probably something you could implement if you chose to. I was just gonna ask about what other data sources haven't you talked about that you think we need to know about? That is a great question. I think 
So I guess one question would be whether you mean data sources federally or locally, um, but you know, one of the things uh, our office tries to do is to sort of put together um, reports that kind of highlight and bring together information that maybe isn't already out there. Uh, we do partner with the Bureau of Justice Statistics that has a plethora of crime data reporting studies, collections. Um, the National Institute of Justice also at DOJ has a number of different research studies. Uh, we actually partnered with NIJ the National Institute of Justice on a study of public defense models across the country recently and essentially just sort of taking stock 60 years after Gideon, um, what do public defenders, how do they look um, today? Um, but they have a whole library of different research reports that they're conducting. Also through our work with the Legal Aid Interagency Roundtable, that's that 28 federal agency collaboration, we're thinking about next year, um, so Every year that body has to put out a report and conduct sort of a high level principles convening where the heads of those agencies come together. I mean, we're talking about access to justice across government. This year we're looking at data. How do we kind of capitalize on the data across federal agencies to use that to um, improve access to justice? So we'd be happy to stay in touch and get you more information once we get a little bit more there too as well. Uh, this will be really quick. It's just a follow up. So. Um uh, we cover a lot of local jurisdictions, collecting data on um, a lot of the local cases. And what we found is that specific, specific to uh, localities, especially urban ones, a lot of that data isn't being collected and even it's being stopped. And I know you talked about uh, meetings you've had. Are there public-private partnerships that you all are looking into, especially in these localities where that data was there at one point, but it was uh, stopped um, regardless of the reason. So is that something that you all are also talking about? Absolutely. So um, our office, I don't think at this point has sort of those public-private partnerships, but yes, there are a number of them. Um, I do think there are a number of national organizations also who are thinking about how they can either fund or themselves collect data and sort of support increased criminal justice system data. Um, so I think, yeah, there are a number of ways that sort of employing that private um, expertise funding resources um, is critical to filling those data gaps. But I will say there are gaps. We know that there are gaps. The the sort of partnership we're doing with the Bureau of Justice Statistics, so there had been this study conducted until 2007 of civil court data. So, you know, how many evictions are happening, how many family law cases. Um, we don't actually have national data on these, on how often this happens. And so we are partnering with BJS to see what does collecting that sort of data look like today and how do we start to kind of revamp uh, that collection? Because I think lack of data is one of the biggest problems. And I, and I do think, I would encourage, if data doesn't exist, I think calling that out is also helpful sometimes too, to just say, you know, data doesn't exist to say if this policy works or not, or, you know, to kind of call out the missing data is helpful for those who are trying to push for more data. With that, uh, your time in the firing line is completed. Uh, <laughs>